The Earth is huge and a wonder to watch. Scientists are still grappling to understand its composition. Compared to the solar system, the Earth is like a drop of water in the ocean. And the solar system is like a molecule in the Milky Way galaxy that contains it. And there are over 100 billion galaxies. An intelligent power is coded into this complex system. Some call it God, Allah, Brahma, Onyami, Nyongbo. Just what is God? At the heart of every religion is the study of God. Just what is God? If we want to understand God, we have to tackle God from scientific point. In other words, let's empty our minds and come to the place of even considering that there is no God, so that we start from that premise to study, research, and discover God. For us to understand God, we have to get a definition for God. When you ask people what is God, they just tell you what they have known, what their parents told them, what their pastors told them, what somebody told them. But the question is, what is God to you? So I want us to have a definition. In my long research into spirituality, I realized that the African has the definition for God, which I consider most appropriate. It says that any happening with an intelligent reason or purpose is equal to conscious presence. In other words, whatever is happening which has got a clear purpose or reason and it is not initiated by man, that then is initiated by a conscious presence. This is the conscious presence some people choose to call God, Onyami. They can't say Onyami, Deunya, Nawa Ming, Cheridiampon, Diakese, Ucherinua, Ombu. That's big tree that does not break when you lean on it. Or Onyankupong, meaning big friend. In the Ga, it is known as Nyongbo, visitor of the dawn. So let's get the definition clear. In the intelligent happening that has a purpose or a reason is equal to conscious presence. And this conscious presence is what people call God. That is, if that conscious presence is not mankind, then it is something outside mankind. You put your clothing into a machine and you put a soap into a small bucket in that machine. You press a knob and go cooking. At the right time, it will ring a bell to let you know that it has finished washing, it has rinsed and has dried your clothing you will agree that there is an intelligent happening here and there's a purpose or reason to it. So that is equal to conscious presence. So anything happening which has intelligent purpose or reason is called conscious presence. So I want us to just start from conscious presence so we get the definition for God. <laughs> the washing machine spins the clothes and washes them. Now what about the universe? Let's look at something that even the scientist, the inventor of the washing machine depends on night and day. Without night and day, life will perish. If it were all daytime and the night never came, things will dry up and everything will die or perish. Again, if it were all nighttime and the day never came, things will get so cold and everything will freeze to death. In fact, Plants will not have the sun for photosynthesis, and they will die. So we need night and day. Just to have night and day, the earth we are sitting on, walking on, or standing on right now is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. You see, the circumference of the earth is 24,000 miles. And today, science, studying the speed of the earth, the speed of the moon, the angle, the direction, the path of the sun. They can even predict exactly when an eclipse is going to occur. So we now know the circumference of the earth and we know that since it does one revolution in a day, it means it is traveling at 1,000 miles an hour. Think of it. When you drive at 100 miles an hour, think of what that means. And now 1,000 miles an hour spinning. Not only that, if it were all winter and we don't get spring, summer, or autumn, life will perish. If it were all summer and the other seasons do not follow, life will perish. So for us to have the seasons alone, 
the earth must be speeding along its path around the sun so that it can experience the various phases of the sun. The speed at which the earth is going around the sun is 67,000 miles an hour. Now let's think of it. It is spinning a thousand miles an hour on its axis and speeding at the same time around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. And for the North Pole and the South Pole to get their share of the sun, the Earth intelligently moves the North Pole to the sun and then the South Pole to the sun. So it keeps dancing back and forth, spinning at the same time and speeding around the sun at the same time. And all these are happening without my input, your input. And all these are happening so that there will be life, so that you and I can exist. So that the scientists who invented even that washing machine will have life to exist and be able to do it. The power that is doing this within the very earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, <laughs> is what people choose to call God. Onyami, Onyanu Anawami, Nyongbo, visitor of the dawn. That is God. Because we all depend on this presence. We all depend on night and day. We depend on the seasons. And we consider them as just happenings. Now we know better. Jesus advised us to love our neighbors. Some neighbors we have to love dearly are the plants. When we look at the chemistry between plants and animals, we realize an intelligent happening with a purpose or reason. We take in air and we absorb and assimilate the oxygen and then we pour out the carbon dioxide. The plants taking air, they absorb the carbon dioxide and they breathe out purified oxygen. This balance alone tells us that <laughs> there is an intelligent purpose within animals that makes them breathe and take the oxygen and release carbon dioxide. And that intelligence is balanced by plants that take in the carbon dioxide and they give us purified oxygen. Without this process, life will perish. And this happening is happening without my input or the input of any animal or mankind. This happening is what people choose to call God. I choose to call it creative love intelligence. CLE for short. Cosmic love intelligence or creative love intelligence. Just that. Now let's consider the intelligence in atoms. Atoms contain within themselves the intelligence that predetermines what type of combinations they will make. For example, hydrogen atom knows that two of its kind must come together with oxygen atom to form a water molecule. We do not set this in motion. We do not imprint this upon the atoms. That self-knowingness within the atom, the smallest particle of matter on the earth, mm. We call it God. So God is imprinted in life, in the very atoms that constitutes the cells of our bodies. And may I talk about the cells? <laughs> Every human being is made up of about 100 billion cells. Each cell has the intelligence to know where it belongs. So the cells of the eye know where they should belong. And each cell has got its own protein manufacturing plants, carriers, and defense system. So each cell is like a city by itself. And we have 100 billion. And we have not coded this wisdom, intelligence, and management into the cells. Look at the flow of energy in your body alone. You do not breathe. Life breathes you. You can choose to say that I'm not breathing for one minute. <laughs> and then life says, breathe in, breathe out, and it begins to pump you in and out. Check it. All these are happening without your input. And here we see intelligent happening for purposes. Because without this intelligent happening, for this purpose or reasons, you would have perished. This intelligence happening in the cells, in the organs of your body. The divine symmetry we see is what we choose to call God. When the first astronauts went into space, they were struck with awe when they saw this floating blue planet we call Earth. This planet alone has thousands of species of plants and their flowers 
thousands of species of birds, thousands of species of fishes. It is a marvel. And all these blend, supporting each other for life to be. If I will go into details, <laughs> I will not end. When you consider the force of gravity, it pulls everything down. You may tend to think that it is pulling things down, meaning it is negative. Without the force of gravity, we cannot walk. We cannot play soccer. We cannot play basketball. We cannot do anything. The force of gravity is holding everything to the earth. If the earth has not got the force of gravity, everything will be floating into outer space and there will be no family of humankind or there will be no family of the planet of humankind's animals, plants and the things that be because everything will be floating into outer space. I see the force of gravity like the generous arms of Mother Earth holding all of her children together, loving them and keeping them to herself and saying, let's stay together as a family. She's a mother. No wonder the Akans call her as I say, yeah. So you see, the force of gravity appears as an obstacle. But what appears as a pull-down energy is the power of creativity. How interesting. Check your obstacles. <laughs> they hold the power of creativity in them for your highest good. Through scientific study of the universe, we can predict when an eclipse will occur. Because through scientific study of the universe we are living in, we know the size of the Earth, the size of the Moon, the size of the Sun, the size of the group of stars we see in the night. When you consider the marvel of the Earth, all the things on the Earth, the size of the Earth compared to the solar system that contains it, is like a drop of water in the whole ocean. Think of a drop of water in the whole ocean. The solar system is the Sun with the group of planets that are going around it and all the spaces between them. And I say, the size of the Earth, with all of its marvel and content, 6.5 billion people on the planet, <laughs> with all of the species of fishes, uh, birds, and uh, whatnot, the Earth is like a drop of water in the solar system. The family of planets going around the Sun, the solar system. And you know what? Our Sun is just like one of the stars we see in the night. Each star you see in the night is a burning sun. Some are burning 10 times, 100 times brighter than our sun, but they are far off. The group of stars we see in the night is a family of stars we call the Milky Way Galaxy. This Milky Way Galaxy contains about 400 billion stars, 400 billion suns, if you may think it that way, of which our sun is but a specimen. A light year is the distance it takes light to travel in a year. Traveling at a speed of 186,000 miles per second per second. Meaning, traveling at a speed of 11,160,000 miles per second. And the distance of our galaxy is 80,000 light years. Meaning, when you are traveling in the spacecraft or flying, from one point to the other, and you are traveling at a speed of 11,160,000 miles per second, it will take you 80,000 years. Think of how many generations in between. <laughs> and God is present in all of this space, intelligent presence, everything moving. There's no clash. Everything is mathematically perfect. This intelligent purposefulness is what we choose to call God. Onyami, the Onyanawa mean that which satisfies. Nyongbo, mm -hmm. visitor of the dawn. So we get a picture of God, how awesome God is. And that is not all. Science has so far discovered about a hundred billion galaxies. And the spaces between them are some of them thousands of light years apart. Think of the awesomeness, the vastness of God. <laughs> and sometimes people get up and say, God said, God said, and God came to me in a dream and asked, which God? <laughs> Think of the awesomeness, the vastness of God. God is not a person. 
sitting somewhere. The intelligence we have discovered is present in the atom and in every unit of life. It is God. Keep quiet if you don't know it. We put words into God's mouth and God said unto the Israelites, go and kill the Amalekites completely. In other words, kill them, kill their children, kill their grandchildren, their great, great grandchildren. Which God will do this? This awesome God? Of course not. After all, the Bible tells us in Galatians 4, 24, that the story of Abraham and Isaac was an allegory. So either what you read it's an allegory, a fiction, or it must have a deeper spiritual meaning. And if you don't have the deeper spiritual meaning, then please put it away. It's not for you. Now we have to investigate scripture against the awesomeness of God and ask ourselves, will this vast awesome God from the atom through the cell, through the the uh, solar system through the Milky Way galaxy and the entire universe. Will this God do this? Check God out now for yourself. The Akans used to say something. They say, Obia nchire abofra nyami, meaning nobody teaches God to a child. In other words, God is so self-evident that everyone must find God for himself or herself. If someone tells you about God, it's a lie. You must make the discovery for yourself. And this explanation of God will give you a vision of the awesomeness, the vastness that we choose to call God. Oh, let the world truly shut up if they will talk about God. Let's contemplate on the awesomeness of God and be still and allow God to be God in us, through us and as us. Be still, for in stillness shall be your strength. Contemplating the vastness of God, you fertilize your mind with the vast energy of God. And you are filled with this power. Let God be God in you. Huh. To think that this awesome presence created another power, this intelligent presence has created another power that is constantly fighting it and sabotaging its work, is absurd. This huge, vast, awesome intelligence has created another power, a so-called devil that is always fighting it. <laughs> God makes common sense. And common sense must let us know that this cannot be. God is too intelligent for such. It is a blasphemy to think that way. And an insult to your own intelligence to think that God could create another power almost like itself, almost equal in strength like itself, and fighting it <laughs> before the beginning of time. And that is certainly an insult to your own intelligence to think that way. You know, it is sheer arrogance also to think that your sins can offend this awesome presence. It is sheer arrogance. That is why the Bible told us in Titus 1.15, that unto the pure all things are pure. And this God, as we can see, this supreme intelligence, this creative or cosmic love intelligence, Kli, is so powerful, so pure to see our sins. Unto the pure all things are pure, and this intelligence is absolutely pure. Again, Habakkuk 
113 tells us that God's eyes are too pure to behold iniquity. In other words, the perfection, the awesome perfection of God is so vast than to see our little human errors. You see, the intelligence is in the atom. The intelligence that makes the atom go through certain combination is embedded within the atom. So in other words, God's intelligence or presence is within life itself. God's law, intelligence, and order is within you. And when you do error, it will prick your own conscience until you wake up. And the error will be there for you to experience, re-experience till you outgrow it through learning. God is too big and too vast to see the little sin you have created. It is for you to learn from and outgrow. In my consciousness, the devil does not exist. God is absolute love. Absolute means 100%. I cannot give credit to any other power besides the power of God. God must be and is 100%. And in any case, if you think even there is a devil, Hmm. Let your mind be 100% focused on God so there's no space for the devil. People believe that God Almighty with all his power, with all his might, with all his magnificence, punishes us because of our sins. God does not punish us because of our sins. Let's have this analogy in which a small child comes slapping me. I will not be the child back. What I'll do is that I would rather pick the child up, cuddle him, and put him on my lap. Because when you look at the ratio between me and the child, it's about 1 to 25. So I will not retaliate. In the same way, let's look at the ratio between us and God. It is vast, infinite. Sin is simply missing the mark. Jesus told us that you will reap what you sow. Whatever you sow is what you reap. It is as simple as that. That is the law of life. How can one think that the purity that God is can be defiled by human error or sin? Titus 1.15 says that unto the pure all things are pure and to him who is defiled even his own mind is defiled. And then secondly Habakkuk 1.13 also says that the eyes of God are too pure to behold iniquity. Now we see God as law and order in every cell of our body. Our God as law and order governs our entire being. The law of our life judges us. It condemns us. And sometimes when our conscience is sufficiently pricked, for example by pain, we rise up unto righteousness. The scriptural writings about the devil are allegories, and we need to understand these allegories. For example, people think and still think that there was a human or physical devil standing there tempting or testing Jesus on the mountain. A little study into the scripture there will tell you that the highest mountain is not in Israel. And according to scripture, Jesus was taken to the highest mountain and the highest mountain is not in Israel. Again, when you are on the highest mountain, you cannot see the whole world. So the mountain spoken of is not a physical mountain. It is the place of possibility in you. When anyone rises to some financial high level of possibilities, social possibilities, such as the person becoming a director of a big company, minister of state or something, there is always a temptation to use our power for our personal pleasure. So the mind begins to give you those temptations and it happened in Jesus. If you will worship me, I'll give you the whole world. In other words, if you will yield to your senses with the powers you have attained in this 40 days fasting and all the previous discipline, you can rule the whole world. Use your power for personal pleasure. So people will trust you, fly, so they will trust you. These were the usual temptations anybody gets into. If you come into spiritual power, social power, financial power, you are always tempted with similar temptations like Jesus. The temptation was in Jesus' mind. When the Bible said in Psalm 121, I will lift my eyes onto the hills, he did not mean Makati Hill 
or some hill in your country. It means I will lift up my eyes onto the place of possibilities within me. We need spiritual understanding of the scriptures. Science has evolved and new scientific discoveries have outgrown and overthrown old ones. When it comes to religion, we are not scientific. We do not want to think. The scriptures are meant to make us go outside our box of thinking and to see the vastness of life. However, we are behaving like little chicks in the eggshell. We do not want to peck and come out of our shells. When we do, what a wonderful horizon we will see, bigger than the shell we used to be in. Life is awaiting your discovery. Life is awaiting your wake up, wake up. This is awakening, so you wake up, discover your magnificence, and celebrate the hugeness, the vastness of life, of God, and of you, mm -hmm. of you. You see, the scriptures were written for people long time ago who did not know the awesomeness of God. They used even to think that the center of the world is the earth and the moon, the stars and so on, they are going around the earth. They did not know that it is the earth that is speeding around the sun and dancing on its path. We are in a new age and we need new awareness. Now you know the awesomeness of God. And you also know the absoluteness of God. God is the only power. The devil is a myth. If you give any credit or percentage of power to the so-called devil, you have reduced the intelligence of the awesomeness of God. You have no right to do that. In Mark chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, the Bible tells us that, For from within out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, deceit, wickedness, lasciviousness, blasphemy, an evil eye, pride, and foolishness. All these come from within and defile the man. If therefore there is a devil, then it is within your own mind. Check it out. After all, you are the owner of your own God temple. Many people are still in the outmoded teaching that God is a person somewhere in the sky. The ancient Greek used to think that way. When you think of God as a person who is always worried about his act and you may call devil, your mind is filled with fear and worry. But when you contemplate on the vast awesomeness of God, you are filled with vast and awesomeness power. God is too perfect and too powerful and perfect to have an enemy. No earthly parent will lock up their children in a room with a poisonous snake to hunt them. And God is too loving to do that. The devil picture produces fear which destroys our rational thinking, creativity and causes many diseases in our lives. God cannot tell us to fear not when he has created a so-called devil to hunt you. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 that God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, any teaching that produces fear is not of God and is not from God. We reduce God if we accept popular preaching by pastors that God, who is all omnipotent, all powerful, everywhere present, created us all, but decided to love us because we are Christians and hate others because they are not. If one was to be born in Iraq, or Mecca, for example, to the chief Imam, what, what will be the chances of that person becoming a Christian? Now, this God, who is all loving, we are taught, creates hell. That is, if this hell really exists, and burns some of us in because we are not Christians. Is this the God that we know to be I believe that and I know and I trust that God is with all of us irrespective of our color, our race, our creed, our religion.
and that is the truth. The Bible says, and I quote, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is within all, through all, and as all. That is Ephesians 4, verse 5. So there's only one presence as all things. This is God's garden. The one presence of God has changed in frequency and is functioning as all things. Diamond, coal, and carbon, their substance is the same. In one state, it is called diamond, a shining object. In another state, it is coal, a black, dirty object. In another state, it is carbon, a gas. So you see, the one has changed in forms, but the one is the same through all the forms. So it is one God, one Lord, one Father, Mother God presence through all of life. This is God's garden. We are one family. We are one mankind, irrespective of our race, creed, or culture. This is God's universe. Let's celebrate ourselves. We can put away our foolish pride and love ourselves as one mankind. Most religious teachings of today are dividing mankind. It's propagating the philosophy of this is the only way and your way is evil, your way is of the devil. We keep labeling some churches, some groups, some religions as evil. Then we condemn them, separating ourselves. That is not like part of the awesomeness of God. People even get up saying they are fighting for God. Who can fight for this awesome God? Let's realize that we are all one. And the great master Jesus came to teach this oneness. In his master teaching, he summed all the spiritual laws into love God with all of your mind, with all of your heart, and your neighbor as yourself. And when they asked him, who is my neighbor? He told them the story of the good Samaritan telling Jews that Samaritans are your neighbors. And according to scripture, Samarians and Jews were arch enemies. So Jesus, 2,000 years ago, to tell Jews, Samarians are your neighbors, was very important. That's not all. He demonstrated it. In John chapter 4, Jesus was on Samarian mountain, something a Jew would not do. He spoke with a Samarian. He asked the woman to give him water to drink from Samarian well. And according to the Bible, Jews and Samarians were arch enemies that they never walked the same road. So it was blasphemy for Jesus to be on Samarian mountain, speak with Samarian woman, and ask her water to drink. This is simply teaching us that those who are enlightened like Jesus, they see the oneness of God in all of life. The oneness of the awesomeness of God in all of life. Long after the death of Jesus, Peter, whom Jesus had blessed as the foundation of his church, was still in the consciousness of, we are the Jews, we are the special ones, and all else are evil. Like some will say today, I am a Christian, or I am a Muslim, or I am a Hindu, or I am an African traditionalist, and all the rest are evil. We label ourselves as the best, and all else are evil. Until Peter had a revelation in a dream. And let me quote that. That is Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 35. Then Peter woke up from the dream, and this is what he said. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but that in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So from this reading, you realize that it is not about the church you attend, the religion you are affiliated with. It is about discovering the awesomeness of God and working righteousness. Then you are accepted with him. So it's about working righteousness. That was the revelation to Peter and to you. What God said to Peter, God is saying to you and to everybody right here, right now, and forever that it is not the religion we are in you see some people just love praising their religious teacher as the best the highest it does not matter how perfect your mathematics teacher is it matters what you learn from him and whether you will pass the examination that is what is important some will want to say 
Jesus is the greatest, Muhammad is the greatest, Buddha is the greatest. What is important is what are you doing? How are you learning of Jesus so that you will become a much perfect version of Jesus? Because Jesus said, if you believe, you will be and do greater than I am. Get up and let's start being righteous in God, the awesome God. Religion comes from the Latin word religare, which means to join or to yoke together, to bring together. If religion does not bring people together, then I'm afraid it's a cult. This awesome God, how can people say they are fighting for God? They know that they are fighting for their own selfish pursuits and by this displaying their ignorance of God. We see intelligent purpose in the being we choose to call creative love, intelligence or God. So you need to realize that man is not a sinner, an outcast or exile here. Man is here by divine purpose. So you need to realize that you are not a mistaken handiwork of God. Man is here by purpose, from the same creative love intelligence that is purposeful in all of his ways. This is why the Bible tells you in the words of Jesus, Luke chapter 17, verses 20 to 21. It says the kingdom of God comes not with observation or signs for anyone to say it is here or it is there. The whole kingdom of God is within you. The love, joy in the presence of God is within you as you. So we are all made of the same spiritual intelligence, but man, I believe, is a very high manifestation of spiritual intelligence. That is why the Bible says that man was created in the spiritual image and likeness of God. Of all the animals, all the blooded creatures on the planet, the intelligence of man is amazing. <laughs> We've not seen any animal inventing anything yet. That is not to say that the intelligence of God is not in them. They have their roles that they are playing for our highest good. And we have to celebrate life as a family. You see, reading the Bible, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, telling us that we are created in the spiritual image and likeness of God, instantly lets us realize that we are part of the awesome intelligence. You are part of God. This awesome intelligence is not separate or apart from you. You cannot say you are God, but you cannot also say that you have a separate identity from God. There are no two waves that are alike. Yet no wave can say that it is separate from the ocean. As sure as the wave is one with the ocean, I am one with God and you are one with God. God is the vastness, the awesome vastness. And I am the awesome wave in the ocean. And that's what you are. Life is about the discovery and realization of your awesome potentialities, your awesome divine potentialities, their expression and expansion. Focus on what you are as a divine image of the awesome presence we choose to call CLE, Creative Love Intelligence or God. I love Creative Love Intelligence. It's more meaningful. That's why I prefer that. My mission is to help you Discover the awesome God. Know God for yourself. It is my belief that when we wake up and we discover God, all the wars in the name of religion will cease. We shall have peace on this planet. Because three quarters of the wars in this world are fought in the name of religion. And it should not be so. How could we say we are fighting for this awesome God? You know the truth. You're fighting for your own selfishness for your own selfish pursuits. You are not fighting for God. When you know the awesomeness of God, you will discover the one family of God that we are. We will begin to discover our own selves, respect our value. We will have a very powerful, optimistic self-value. We will love ourselves, then we can love our brothers and sisters around us. Then, we have the world of peace. This is God's paradise and we can celebrate it now. I welcome you to Divine Consciousness.